morning. So Alex and I had an opportunity on Friday to spend some time at the Niagara Regional Native Center and um, participated in some of their activities. Uh, I did some archery, which was <laughs> an interesting experience. Um, so all I could think of when I was holding the, you know, the bow and arrow was, you know, the term harmatia. It's an archery term, which means to miss the mark, and it's something that they used to describe the word sin. So was, I was just thinking about how th those connections are everywhere we look. And so in honor of Indigenous History Month and Indigenous History Day, I did investigate how our passage today can guide what I have heard called Turtle Island hermeneutics. Uh, the Americas are commonly uh, called Turtle Island among the indigenous people groups here in this area. And the Oxford Dictionary defines hermeneutics as the brand of knowledge that deals with interpretation, especially of the Bible or literary texts. It's derived from the Greek word hermeneutikos, which means interpret. There are four steps of the hermeneutic process, which include understanding the historical and cultural context, understanding the literary context, making observations, considering those contextual facts, and drawing applications. The hermeneutical process can help us to approach any text of the Bible in our search for God's intended meaning. So what does this have to do with indigenous people? When uh, the early missionaries and authorities arrived on Turtle Island as part of the process of colonization, they indeed entered a land that had been created and sustained by the triune God they knew in Jesus Christ. Jesus was already in this land. But these authorities, sadly, were unable or unwilling to discern Christ in indigenous cultures. Indigenous cultures often preserve their historical knowledge and cultural information through the oral tradition. The elders and knowledge keepers hold a prominent place among the people because of their ability to retain and share traditional and cultural knowledge. Each nation has a particular history and a cultural identity that is expressed through this oral tradition. It is rare to have an entire history written from their own perspective, but recent Indigenous scholarship has created a body of work that is reliable and beneficial for teaching and sharing for mutual growth. Now, because of my relationship with the local Indigenous peoples, I have been given access to some of this written work, dealing with the history of the Six Nations, known also as the Iroquois or Haudenosaunee Confederacy. I have noticed that by listening to the voices of indigenous peoples, the church can hear Christ's own voice as we rejoice in their witness to the creator God who was already at work through Jesus and the spirit long before the arrival of the colonizers. Please join me as I pray through Psalm 139, seven to 14. Oh dear God, you are so good and we can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even in darkness I cannot hide from you. To you the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. Your grace is everywhere. There is nowhere we can go, your love cannot reach us. We thank you that through your spirit you are present with us, recreating the world and humanity so that we can truly love you and others. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'd like to invite you into the history of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, or Six Nations, through a retelling of their creation story. This small part of their history was dictated by Tom Porter, who is a Bear Clan elder of the Mohawk Nation, as it was told to him by his grandmother. It was compiled with other teachings into a singular written work entitled, And Grandmother Said, Iroquois Teachings as Passed Down Through the Oral Tradition. With gratitude to Elder Tom, this part of their story begins. This is called The Teacher, a Retelling. In the time before there were Onondagas, before there were Senecas and Cayugas and Oneida, 
and before they were the Mohawk, all the six nations were just one people. When the trees were six arm spans wide, and the Europeans had not yet felled the first of our brothers, the stories of many yesterday's past tell of chaos and conflict becoming normal. They tell us of warring and trouble that came among us because the people had put down the Creator's teachings and did not put them in the hearts and minds of the children. The people became decadent and lost direction. There was no more respect or community. But the Creator, wanting to replant the goodness, summoned the four sacred beings. The teacher agreed to be the Creator's messenger and to teach his ways to the new generation. Creator sent the teacher with his message through an Iroquois woman who was a virgin. At that same time, Creator caused 11 married women from all over Turtle Island to give birth to sons of their own. When the tale of the child with no father, born at the same time as theirs, reached their ears, they were powerfully drawn to find this special child. Without knowing why or where they were going, the women found themselves together at the Virgin's Lodge. The mothers and the children grew together, and they had strong friendships that kept the children coming together. The fatherless child, the teacher, began to make plans for them and led them up the hill into the forest each morning. There, surrounded by trees in a natural clearing, formed by the Creator into a perfect circle, the teacher taught them. Day after day, in the clearing, where only grass would grow, surrounded by Creator's creation, until the sun had passed half across the sky, he taught them. The Onindin Geriwadigwan, the, the words we say before anything important. He restored to them their first truths, the creation story and thanksgiving. He restored to them the teachings and workings of the clan system and their four rituals that reminded them of repentance and the importance of harmony, acknowledging creators giving life and purpose to all of creation through ceremony and song. When the eleven had been given the creator's teachings, the teacher sent them to their villages, telling them, there are eleven of you because of human memory. Whatever one lacks, another will have remembered. You will help each other to keep the knowledge and the faith. No one can do all of everything. The people obeyed what the boys told them, bringing the drums and the dance and the sacred teachings to their villages, dividing into their clans. Peace and order came to Turtle Island for many seasons. At the right time, the teacher gathered the boys together in one last time, saying to them, we have done everything we are supposed to do, so now I am ready to journey. Come with me to the edge of this turtle. They set off together, and at the place where the waves of the ocean touched the edge of the turtle, he turned to speak. Across this big water, there is another people. They are not following the Creator's way. They have gone away from their spirituality. Now that I have finished here, I am going there. The wind stopped, and the birds all rested on the nearest tree and kept still. Even the deer came there from all over the woods, still. Only their ears turned forward, big black eyes looking at them. And he said to them, I'm going now to where the rising sun comes from. That is where these people are. So he went down the hill, walking, almost like in the air over the water. And they watched him as he went across that big water toward the east into the sunrise. And his body got smaller as he went further, and smaller and smaller, until he became nothing but a little dot. And then even the dot disappeared. He was gone. And the birds started to fly again, the deer started jumping, and the eleven turned around and went home. The people continued to follow the teachings for many seasons, and communities shared what the land provided, living in a peaceful way with friendship. The boys grew into old men in their own villages, teaching others to keep the teachings and the faith and share them with the people until there were many who could do what they had done. Suddenly, they felt a longing. Each one of the eleven from their own villages were compelled to walk that long ago walk they took with the teacher to the edge of the Turtle Island. They were joyful and sentimental as they met each other on the path, greeting each other warmly, none surprised at the presence of the others as they journeyed together again. As they celebrated with food and remembered together on the edge of the turtle, something began to appear to them on the horizon. They looked curiously as the something came toward them, 
And it came, not right on top of the water, but above the water, flowing like a cloud, below the other clouds. And it was this form of a man. He had all white clothes. And as he got closer, they realized that though he looked different, this was their teacher. They joyfully ran toward him, arms outstretched for an embrace, exclaiming aloud, It is not possible. But then he spoke, opening his garment and showing them his body. His chest was scourged with deep and bloody wounds, and blood oozed from his hands and feet. They did not accept the teachings, and this is what they have done. And so, from here on in, until the sun does not shine anymore, and the rivers do not run anymore, it is going to be that they will never stop fighting. They will fight each other, and blood will always be spilled over there, because they refused my teachings. The teacher blessed them, saying, there will be such a multitude of honor for you when you finish on the earth. I am in the spirit now, so you cannot touch me now, but I came to give you this blessing and to show you this bowl. It was sent to you by the creator as a special gift to celebrate your life. This is the creator's favorite game. Anyone who plays the peach stone game will have his attention immediately because of the depths of his love for it. He told them to observe this at midwinter planting time, and harvest. He blessed them and left. Again, the people continued to keep the teachings the teacher brought them, and for many seasons, the communities shared what the land provided, living in a peaceful way with friendship. So the story can teach us that when we cultivate an attitude of expectancy, the Holy Spirit will help us to recognize that God is at work everywhere. And from this ancient story, we can see that the First Peoples had already encountered the Creator God before the arrival of the colonizers. Holy Spirit was already in the land, revealing God to people through law, custom, and ceremony. The same love and grace that was finally revealed in Jesus sustained the First People and gave them particular insights into God's ways. An important question for us to consider is, have we denied the omnipresence of God, and perhaps even the gospel itself and its message of Christ's universal lordship, if we give the impression that God was brought to the Americas by the churches? Asking crucial questions like this can help to guide our relationships across cultures and help us to recognize God's working in the world. Our today, today's passage from John 14, 15 to 18 we read that the risen Christ returns to believers in the person of the Holy Spirit. He is our counselor, our comforter, our advocate, and our helper. Holy Spirit as helper represents the risen Jesus Christ in the world, and he is the personal presence of Jesus in our lives. Holy Spirit's role is to reveal Jesus like a spotlight. He shines on the Savior as if to say, look at him, listen to him, and hear his word. Go to him and find life. Know him and know the sweet taste of his joy and peace. Holy Spirit brings us to Christ and reveals him to us. He brings us new birth and awakens us to eternal life. Spirit makes us God's children and citizens of the kingdom. Romans 8, 15 to 16 tells us, so you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father, for his spirit himself joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. That new relationship with God is at the heart of what it means to have eternal life, life in all its fullness. The spirit helps us in our relationship with God and helps us to know Jesus and to recognize his working in the world. He helps us to understand the Bible. In John 14, 25, Jesus says, I'm telling you these things now while I am still with you. But when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and remind you of everything I have told you. In 2 Peter 1, 20 to 21, Paul writes, Above all, you must realize that no prophecy in scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from, from human initiative. No, these prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. The writers of the Bible were inspired by the Holy Spirit and we need the Spirit's help to understand and apply the scriptures. 
Romans 8.26 shows us that the Holy Spirit helps us to pray, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father, who knows all hearts, knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. So at the heart of our relationship with God is both speaking and listening to God. We have an easier time of it than the disciples before Pentecost because the Spirit of the living God is inside of us. In his Standard of Christian Living, John Wesley wrote, A Methodist is one who has the love of God shed abroad in his heart by the Holy Ghost given unto him, one who loves the Lord his God with his heart, mind, soul, and strength. He rejoices evermore, prays without ceasing, and in everything is full of love to all mankind and is purified from envy, malice, wrath, and every unkind affection. It is the work of Holy Spirit to help us turn from evil, and then the Holy Spirit helps us to do what is right, bringing the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5.22.23 tells us that the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. So the Spirit works in us to develop the character of Christ. There is a catch, though. You can only have as much of the Spirit's power as you are prepared to have of his holiness. Becoming holy is a lifelong process that continues throughout our time here on earth. In this process, there are two things working simultaneously. It is God's transforming power and our ongoing repentance. The grace to repent comes to us from Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit inside us convicts and encourages us to become more like Jesus. Holy Spirit transforms us into the image of Christ. According to Oswald Chambers, this sanctification process is not something that God does in us. Sanctification is himself in us. God is revealing God to us. Wow. Even so, there are so many distractions and competition for our time and attention that it can be a challenge for us to prioritize our time for the work of seeing him and making him known to those around us. What a difference it makes to know that God is inside us, equipping, equipping us to serve Jesus. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 to 11 tells us, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another miraculous powers. To another prophecy to another, distinguishing between spirits, to another, speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still, to another, the interpretation of tongues. All of these are the work of the one and the same spirit, and he gives them to each one, just as he determines. So the Holy Spirit has equipped every Christ Christian to serve God in one way or another, and to grow in accordance with those gifts, to greater and greater service to him. God is inside of us to help us see and join in the work he is doing in our midst. Part of the work he has called us to do is to tell others what effect the good news of Jesus has had on our lives. This is easier for some than others, but what a difference it makes to know that God is inside of us. In Acts 1-8, to we read, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Holy Spirit gives us a power to be obedient witnesses for Jesus. When we claim Holy Spirit's help in our witnessing, it is he who speaks through us, because he is in us. In Mark 13, 10 to 11, Jesus tells us, For the good news must first be preached to all nations, but when you are arrested and stand trial, do not worry in advance about what to say. Just say what God tells you at that time, for it is not you who will be speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Listen and watch, because Jesus teaches his followers to cultivate an awareness of his presence. Expect Holy Spirit and allow his presence to fill us with the love and motivations of Christ. God is at work in and around us. 
yet we are often unaware of his presence. The biblical narrative reveals to us Creator's deep desire to be in fellowship with us and the thirst of the human spirit for a relationship with him. God always takes the initiative by his grace and seeks to draw us back into relationship. Kenneth L. Cardell writes about grace from a Wesleyan perspective. He explains, the Book of Discipline describes grace as the undeserved, unmerited, and loving action of God in human existence through the ever-present Holy Spirit. He continues, grace pervades all of creation and is universally present. Grace is not a gift that God packages and bestows on us and creation. Grace is God's presence to create, heal, forgive, reconcile, and transform human hearts, communities, and the entire creation. Wherever God is present, there is grace. Grace brought creation into existence. Grace birthed human beings, bestowed on us the divine image, redeemed us in Jesus Christ, and is ever transforming the whole creation into the realm of God's reign of compassion, justice, generosity, and peace. Understanding the dynamics of knowing that God is central to the relationship, he has already revealed himself to us. We need to recognize that across time, God has been and remains active in our world today. He has sprinkled seeds of truth around the globe with Jesus as the fulcrum. We can begin to cultivate an awareness by prayfully asking some crucial questions, like where have I met Jesus or God or Holy Spirit today? Where have I missed Jesus or God or Holy Spirit today? Ask these questions throughout each day and you will be surprised how much more you will recognize God's presence with you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Creator God, make our hearts a chapel where we can withdraw from time to time and commune with you in meekness, humility, and love. Let us all desire this type of communion with you. Renew our minds to the fact that you want to be in relationship, to be an ever-present help in times of trouble, to be experienced in our praises when we lift our hearts in praise of you. Help us to increase our expectancy, to expect you in the midst of our lives, and increase our ability to hear your voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.